<clears throat> Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Ann Risso. I'm the Community Relations Coordinator for Douglas County School District Communications Department. And I wanted to welcome you to Parent University. And with the help of our partner, Sky Ridge Medical Center, uh, our Parent University program aims to provide monthly engaging and relevant content to our school district families and parents. And uh, during this evening's webinar, we will have a 30 minute presentation period with about 15 minutes of question and answers by our panelists. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to place your question in the question and answer box. And if you'd like to answer or ask your question in person, uh, you may do so by raising your hand and I will um, unmute you and allow you to speak. And this webinar uh, will be recorded. It's actually being recorded as we speak, and then will be posted on our um, uh, website, um, YouTube channel, as well as um, the link will be sent to anyone who um, has registered for the event. So on that, uh, let me introduce you to this evening's um, panelists. We have Dr. Stephanie Crawford. Um, and uh, she is our school district director of mental health for student support services. And we also have Dr. Nati, I'm trying to pronounce her name properly because it's beautiful, <laughs> Geva. And um, she is um, the, apologize, um, <clears throat> she is the clinical psychologist for the HCA crisis assessment team, otherwise known as. Um, HCAT. So on that, I will um, let our two panelists start their presentation. Thank you, Anne, and so happy to be here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about anxiety. And I will try to stay away from clinical and more experiential, and um, <clears throat> we'll take it from there. So our system, our whole system is built on routine, on routine, on rhythms, circadian rhythms, if anyone's heard of any of that. We know little children, babies thrive on routine, but all of us really do. We like that um, organizing principle of our day, of our month, of our year. Um, actually, when our routine gets disturbed, we feel stressed because we need to do things differently than we did up to now. So our system, our, our being, our bodies, our minds, our souls, we like things to be the way they are. And when these things get challenged, it challenges the system. We experience it as stress. Um, 1967, two researchers looked at life events and how they affected a person, essentially. Um, here we go. I got rid of the video, so I'm no longer distracted. Um, they looked at how outside events affect us. And it's obvious that when things are difficult, when there's negative outside events, we get really stressed. But one of the very interesting findings of that research is that also good things cause us to stress, good changes, right? Good changes to our routine. So for example, um, getting married is on the seventh most stressful thing up can, that can happen to a person. And if we look a little lower down the list, the 12th um, most stressful thing that can happen to a person is actually being pregnant or their partner being pregnant. So change in and of itself does cause us uh, anxiety and stress. Um, when we think of the past couple of years and how COVID has hit us with all the changes, the ongoing changes, the need to return back from the changes to routine, all of this has been very stressful for us as parents, as adults, but also for our kids. When we look at challenges, really, we can think of them as two types mainly. One of them is the, what I'll call real concerns, and I'll put them in, quote, in, in air quotes, because real concerns are those things that happen to us or happen on the outside that causes us to change um, our routine and feel stress. So for example, with our kids, it could have been going to um, being schooled remotely or going back to school or our parents losing their jobs or all these things were very, very hard. Even coming back, students are having a really hard time with time management, with um, being on top of their academics. They lost two years of that, not to mention two years of socializing, problem solving, conflict resolution. All these things are real difficulties that 
require that adaptation causes stress and potentially anxiety. But there's also what we call fear. And I'm, I'm not talking about the dictionary definition of fear. What I'm talking about is the acronym fear, and that is false evidence appearing real. And so when we have those, we magnify those real concerns or we focus on a part of it that we have no control over. So an example would be being very afraid of finals or being very afraid of high school or having concerns about next year not having friends. All these things are basically a magnification of what we are, what would otherwise be real concerns, only the size that they're taking for us is much bigger. So what's important to realize is that stress and maybe a tiny bit of anxiety are actually adaptive. They're that um, Kickstarter that get us going because when we don't feel any stress whatsoever, we're not motivated to do anything, right? We need that little incentive. We need the deadline. We need the test. We need to know that there's consequences that are going to um, push us to action that help our physiological arousal. So we're paying more attention and our bodies are more ready to respond. So a little stress is not a bad thing. The problem is what happens when there's way too much of it? And when we don't have control over what, if we are already um, ready to take action, if that if we can't if we can't control the future, if we can't control who's going to be in our class, then that arousal just never is never useful and never resolves itself. So a lot of times people ask me, how do we know if the if the stress, the slight anxiety, is adaptive, or if it's already bordered into maladaptive? So what I really urge you to think of it as the five Ds. I'll call them. We know that anxiety or some level of stress is no longer adaptive when it's causing distress, right? Like if someone has butterflies in their tummy and that causes them to think through what they're going to wear to homecoming or what plans they're going to make for Halloween or maybe how they're going to study for the test, that's great. If it's already paralyzing them and they're at the point where they're not taking action, they're actually kind of shutting down, we have a problem. So sometimes our kids have the distress. Sometimes we as parents have the distress. Sometimes the teachers express concerns. So I'm really using very broad terms. Distress in general should give us um, that prompt to think twice about what's going on. The second criteria of when stress and anxiety are a problem are when there is dysfunction. And by the way, these are really big words, but think of them as um, headings as opposed to all-encompassing descriptors. So when I think of dysfunction, I'm thinking the inability to function within the kid's life, right? So what do kids do? They go to school, they do their chores, they hang out with friends, they spend family time, they have after school activities. So we have a problem when a kid either drops in that engagement, either in, in, in academics or friends or family or activities, all those domains that I've specified, or they're completely withdrawing from them or, or from one of them. And that's also a reason for concern. A kid who liked to be with friends and is now isolating, um, a child that was very close to their parents and now is really shutting them off. And we need to remember all these things are on a continuum. And for some, um, for some of these things, there is a developmental expectation. So kids usually turn to their peer group as opposed to their parents as they reach adolescence and above but it's one thing to turn to your peer group and there's another to shut parents and siblings out, right? So we talked about distress, that's the first D. We talked about dysfunction, that's the second D. Um, deviance, and that's a fancy way of thinking of just different from their friend group or different from the group or different from expectations. And this is a slightly tricky one because we know that birds of a feather flock together and sometimes kids who are experiencing challenges kind of join together. And so comparing them to their friend group may not be an ideal way of assessing as to whether or not their stress level is too much. Um, but really looking around and thinking, what do other kids in that environment do or don't do? And how much does the kid um, fit those expectations or not fit? Um, the last one is to look at duration. Is this an ongoing pattern? Is my kid usually an anxious kid? Have they always been and now there's a little bit of heightening? Um, or is it a sudden onset? What is really going on? So trying to look at the, the duration and how it changes over time. And the most important thing, and that's the one red flag, is when there is danger, 
when a kid is talking about um, not wanting to live, wanting to hurt themselves, sometimes um, verbalizing things like, I wish I wasn't alive. These are really big red flags and these are never to be ignored. It doesn't mean that something bad is imminent, but we wanna catch it before it's imminent. So these are the criteria I would urge you to consider when you're thinking whether your kid has um, a temporary small and contained situation that is going to pass more or less on its own or when you need more um, professional intervention because that anxiety, that stress has become a problem. Next slide. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you. And then hearing um, from Dr. Natty about anxiety and in general and what that looks like in our population and our, our students specifically, when you look at kids coming to school and how anxiety might look, there are a lot of ways that your students might be exhibiting that they're having some difficulties with anxiety. Um, and as we've talked about, this might be temporary and it might be more worry and stress about starting school at the beginning of the year. Our students have had summer off. Hopefully that's been a really fun, enjoyable time for them. And that has become their routine. And now they have to get into a new routine of getting back into the grind of school and, and having that routine. A lot of kids will transition pretty well into that and they're excited to have a change from the summer, but some kids have a little more, more difficulty might also see this in younger children um, that have been at home and especially lately where they've they've mainly only been at home maybe they didn't get to do preschool um, due to all of the things going on with the pandemic and so there might be some temporary discomfort and worry and stress about separating from their caregivers and entering into school and and seeing what that is like so you might have concerns and worries like that all the way to some more um, long-term signs of anxiety and issues at school, and that might impact the functioning at school. And so here's just a list of what you might see in your students at school. And as you can see, this has a great impact on our students being available to be in the classroom, pay attention to the lessons, interact with their teacher, interact with their peers, and really get the most out of their learning environment so that they can build skills and make gains and make progress to continue in their long-term learning. And when you are um, looking at this, sometimes you'll hear different terms for this. So as I was talking about maybe leaving the home or leaving the caregiver, you might hear separation anxiety. Well, we might first say that's just some stress of leaving. And if it becomes long-term where it's interfering with the child attending school, not wanting to come, running out of the classroom, we might say that that's separation anxiety and we're gonna to wanna to get some intervention. There's a lot of um, potentially social anxiety in school and performance anxiety. So maybe you know a student might feel really comfortable with a topic or content area, but actually raising their hand and speaking up and being able to show what they know, that might be where there's anxiety, but it doesn't mean that they're not learning. So it'll be important for teachers and for you as parents to look out for what could be causing that change in school or that disruption in the learning. Um, that might also be interacting with peers and transitioning from home, from elementary to middle, from high, middle to high school. Sometimes that's different when you're mixed in with a whole new set of people and that can be exciting and that can be stressful. So being able to interact with our peers. Um, other times there might just be overall general worry. Um, we have students who are very good and capable, but they might want to be so um, good that they over worry and that impacts their functioning. And so again, they, they know a lot of information, but they're not able to show it to us because of their worry. Um, they also, we might have a few students that what we call selective mutism, where they will talk only to you at home and select friends, but they may not talk at school, even though they can. And so we have ways to support students that have that but what I always stress to teachers and you as parents is when your child is acting differently, when they're showing that they might have challenges or you feel challenged or frustrated, to take a pause and figure out what might be going on with them. What might be new? What might be a stressor 
that you can explore with them and explore with school mental health and maybe with community mental health so that we can figure that out and support rather than get into a cycle of having negativity and continuing to decline in functioning at school or out in their community or on their sports teams. And so I think that's that's very important to just be aware of. Um, and, you know, it could be short term and you're getting some tips and you're working with your student and they move on in their transition. If it's becoming longer and it's impacting grades, it's impacting behavior, definitely reach out for support from us at school to make sure we're, we're working with you and teaming with you to get your child um, that much needed help. All right, so we can go on to the next slide. Thank you. I love what you said, Stephanie. I really did. I think that um, taking the time to talk to your kid is kind of where it all um, converges into. And so it really does connect to my point of connection, that if we want our kids to share with us, because we want to help them, right? We as parents want to help our kids. We as professionals want to support our students. In order for them to feel that they can share things with us, they really need us to connect to them. So they're going to share more and we can come up with better solutions when we actually know what's going on. Um, so I, I, usually, I like to give the metaphor of walking into a doctor's office and the doctor um, confusing you with another patient. They use the wrong name. They're not really sure who you are. And very quickly you're wondering, do they even know who I am? And then they write up all kinds of um, prescriptions, right? Some of them having horrible side effects. They tell you that you need to disrupt your life the way you know it and do all these things that are so burdensome. And if the doctor didn't know your name when you walked in, I can guarantee that the likelihood that you're gonna follow up on what they recommend is very low because you feel that they don't know you, they don't understand you. And if they don't know you and understand you, how could they possibly help you? And so the most important thing is to really connect with your child. And yes, we all want to connect, but I wanna address some of those barriers that get in the way of connection. And one of them is we're busy. A lot of parents are very busy holding down jobs, taking care of families. Our world is a very high intensity world. And so we run from one thing to the next. And sometimes we just don't find that downtime. And on the topic of downtime, I think that there is a cultural myth of the quality time, right? If I spend 15, 20 minutes a day on a one-on-one -on -one with my kid, that is enough. Now, don't get me wrong. Quality time is very important. Absolutely. If you're one of those parents that does that one-on-one -on -one time, do not, do not take it away. What I'm suggesting is that we need more than just quality time. A lot of time the kids connect with, when it's actually low stakes, when you're doing something that is not um, active engagement. So um, let, me, let me try and define and, and put it in a tidier wrapping. It's not that you don't engage in a joint activity, it's that it's not necessarily in back and forth of back and forth. It's not necessarily that you are teaching your child a skill or that you are um, asking them about school, although these are very good ways to connect. The non-quality time, the quantity time provides that comfort together. It provides opportunities for things to come up, right? Someone honked at you when you were driving, something came up on the radio, someone was wearing a particular t-shirt when you guys crossed the street together and your kid comments on it or you comment on it and it becomes an opportunity to talk. These are really the golden moments where a lot of the communication happens. Um, sometimes we have our own stuff that comes up um, and gets in the way. And that is sometimes we project our own experience on our kids, especially if our kids have the same temperament as us, maybe the same interests as us. We think of how we were at their age and we assume that they were are like us or we're ashamed of things or, or don't wanna talk about things when we were their age. And so we avoid certain topics or we think that hmm, maybe, maybe if I avoid it, they'll come to me. But the reality is like many things, if we don't ask, we won't get the answer. Not saying it won't all the time, but if you wanna know the answer, ask the question and have that foundation to, um, to listen. And then what also you can do is not only take the time 
and listen without judgment. So really listening to hear what they say. Don't listen for solutions initially. Initially, listen to listen, not to criticize, not to tell them what you would do. Sometimes it's really hard, right? Sometimes our kids do the, the, the craziest things and it takes all our willpower to contain, but that is that um, deposit you're putting in that relational account that later you can draw on. So it's really important that you convey that you are on their side, not conditionally, not if they do what you tell them to do, not if you even agree with them, especially when you and they disagree, conveying to your kids that you support them, you're on their side, is that building of the connection, right? And building that connection so they feel that you understand them, so they confide in you, so you get better information and you can help them from there. So when we're thinking about that help, what does that help look like? And there's really two ways of thinking about it. And when our kids are very rattled, they're very upset, they're very angry, they're having very strong emotions, the best way to help them is really what we call from the from bottom up, from the ground up. And we're talking about grounding techniques. So grounding techniques for anxiety are techniques that help us focus on the here and now in our body. So not in three weeks when. Not back in the day when I accidentally or made a mistake. No, no, no. We're talking about right here, right now. Okay. And then we also talk about in our body. So not just being an abstract fear, not an abstract what if, because really we can't work with the what if. Um, we can go what if and solve a problem, what if and solve a problem, but there's always a million things. What's more important is that your kid knows that no matter what that what if is, you're going to be there with them. And right now, they are okay for this right now for that one moment. So grounding is one. Breathing techniques, I would go over these with you, but we don't really have the time for it today. So I really encourage you to look up two techniques um, or one technique and one kind of um, auxiliary system. One of them is box breathing. Box breathing. So just go on YouTube and look up box breathing. There's three minutes, there's six minutes. Um, there's a little visual of the box. It's amazing how well it works, especially when kids are anxious. The second thing is working out. And yes, you can do a very um, intensive and intense workout, but really even a brief walk around the block, anything that requires you to take more deliberate breaths is going to help you. The third way to work from the ground up is meditation. Now, I strongly recommend you don't say that word to kids because they have this reaction. You say meditation, zh, their eyes glaze over, they're not interested. So when I think of meditation, I think of focus and I think of a repetitive motion and an attempt to continue that. That could be as easy as coloring books. I know that's very popular these days, knitting. Um, and with some of my boys, what I do is I throw a ball around and it doesn't need to be a football and, you know, a big park. It could be a tennis ball and we throw it back and forth and back and forth. Sometimes we sit shoulder to shoulder. I know that some kids are better talking when they don't have to look me in the eye, especially when it's difficult topics. So we sit shoulder to shoulder and we throw the ball at the wall. One of us throws, the other one catches. Um, I've actually had a little one who, who saw um, a lizard stuffy and wanted to make Lizzie fly, um, and Liz Lizzie flew, and we threw the lizard back and forth and back and forth, and that was kind of our repetitive motion that kind of settled us into that rhythm. So that is the practice from the ground up. Practice makes better. Once kids do open up, I recommend that you choose one or two things, not more than that, the thing that is most upsetting, most demanding from them, and really problem solve together in a very succinct way. Um, don't make it complicate, complicated, really simplify, and then practice it once or twice. So how do I ask someone to the dance? How do I tell someone I don't want them copying my answers? How do I approach the teacher and ask for help? And then you practice it one, two, three times. It doesn't have to become um, over overburdensome but it just needs to be that the kid knows what to do, how to do it. And when they come to you later and tell you that they tried, even if they say that they botched it, that they stammered, that they didn't get it fully right, applaud them and reinforce the fact that they've done it. Now, what's important really is to remember that the connection is at the base of all of that. Because if we don't start there, 
what we risk is that our kids really won't feel heard, won't feel listened. And so sometimes we have the best of intention and we want them to see the silver lining. We want them to think about it differently. We want them to consider what the other person is going through. And all these are really, they're good. They're, they're part of what makes us human. They're definitely good skills to have. But when we jump to that before we let them know we're on their side, we've got their back, we, we understand them. What our kids hear is that we don't agree with them. We don't like them. We're mad at them. And we think everything they do is wrong. And that kind of shuts them down, which is exactly the opposite of what we want. So we talked a little bit about what to do. I've mentioned earlier the five Ds, distress, dysfunction, deviance, duration, and danger. But I want to say that you can even think about it in simpler terms. When do you need professional help? When you've tried stuff and it doesn't work. Actually, things are getting worse. And you know what? If your kid is um, not looking good, and by that I mean Maybe they're not eating well, they're not sleeping well, maybe they're um, not taking good care of themselves. If they're verbalizing um, concerning expressions like hurting themselves, not wanting to be alive, um, this is the time to get help. Um, before I wrap up and hand this over to Stephanie again, I wanna say something really important. When I talk about self-help, a lot of what people assume is that I talk about our kids, our students, and that is absolutely true but kids don't have a lot of experience. Kids rely on the adults in their lives to regulate them, to guide them, to contain them. When the adults in one's life are dysregulated, they are bouncing right and left. They're very stressed and anxious themselves. It makes it very hard for them to do what they really wanna do and that is take care of our kids. So I wanna encourage you all that if you are feeling anxious, if you are feeling depressed, if you're feeling the effects of the four Ds on you, that distress, dysfunction, deviance, duration, and danger, that is the time to get help because when we help anyone in the family, we all improve the quality of life of everyone in the family and especially our kids who are relying on us. All right, thank you. And when we're looking at our students and your, your children um, who may have some anxiety and need some extra support, when we're at our schools, we have different layers of support. So first we look to support every single student with what we call universal strategies. So we're giving this skill building information and tools to all of our kids. We're doing that in the classrooms with the way we set up our rooms, our routines, how our teachers are modeling for our students. And then we also have supports for students who may need a little bit extra skill building, our at-risk students. And that is when our school counselors or our school social workers or school psychologists might have a group of kids that have been identified that they have some skills they need to build in a certain area. And that's what might be causing them some stress. And so, they're able to get that support through a small group or maybe one-on-one, -on -one, depending on what the nature of the difficulty might be. This is looking at, this is an issue that may be very developmentally appropriate, but it is starting to get in the way of school and, and them enjoying school and their outside life. And so they can build these skills and then move on. Um, in, our, in our district, we have some great curriculums that we use to teach um, executive functioning skills. Those are those skills we need to be organized, be able to regulate our emotions and be able to complete tasks. So you think of like, what do I need to be able to go to class, pay attention, know what's needed for an assignment or a project and actually get that completed while also managing all the other aspects of our life. So we might give skills in certain areas in that. Also just overall, how do I make friends? How do I keep my friends? What do I do if we have a conflict? How do we resolve that with each other? And if we have a stressor or we become escalated, because goodness knows we're going to be at times we're humans, we have a range of emotions. How do we handle those in a way that is helpful for us and that we can be successful versus a way that might be damaging to our relationships or destructive in our lives? So we're teaching all of our kids these skills. And then if if they have more intensive needs, they have a chronic long-term 
difficulty with anxiety, there are additional educational supports that we can put in place to make sure students are being accommodated for those needs. Um, maybe they have difficulty and anxiety in the hallways, and so they get a special passing time that is not with other students. They might also need more services where they're, they're learning skills, then they're practicing those skills, then they get coaching and they get some support to make sure that that continues to work for them. So we're providing that in our schools and you know that can be from the very young, our preschool age, all the way to our high schoolers and some of our adult students that have significant needs. One of my favorite books that I love to use with littles is called Hey Warrior and it's a kid's book about anxiety. There's a lot of kid's books about anxiety and they all really look at our brain and specifically our amygdala and how that can really impact how regulated we are, and I love it. So these are tips you can do with your kids. Um, I have a little one myself in elementary school, and we will read books like this and practice our breathing that Dr. Natty talked about. And there's some fun activities with box breathing or putting a stuffed animal on your belly and watching it rise and fall to make sure you're getting that deep breathing and keeping it really simple. Um, same can be with our older kids, talking for them of to stay present in the moment, doing that box breathing that Dr. Natty talked about, or maybe muscle relaxation, other techniques to stay in the moment, focus on what's going on, that we're okay, and trying to remain regulated and calm. Um, if there is more intensive needs, we will refer families to outside supports, and we will work in, and make sure that we're collaborating with outside therapists or psychologists or psychiatrists. We don't want to um, get in anyone's private business, we just wanna make sure that if your child is receiving therapy or support, that we are collaborating and we're speaking the same language and we're teaching the same skills and reinforcing the same good um, techniques that they're learning so that they can be successful. And then I know we wanna save time for questions so we can go on to the next slide. Um, you know, we really wanna just leave you with, really keep it simple when you're dealing with anxiety or any other issues. Um, we are busy people. It is really hard to be present in the moment. Um, we have amazing brains that can live in the past and really stress over what we did and what do people think and how are we going to get over that. And we have brains that can live in the future and worry about all kinds of, you know, terrible to very terrible things that may or may not realistically happen. And, and we have amazing ability to do that. So the best thing is to stay in the now and what my action be happening. And so give yourself and your child a break. Um, life is stressful. It's okay to feel stress. Um, I recently was asked um, by a staff member, what are you doing to make sure kids don't have negative feelings? And my answer is, that's not my goal. We all have feelings, positive and negative, and that's natural. The goal is to teach kids about those feelings and what they're like and how to identify them and then how to respond. So I'm not trying to de decrease negative feelings. I'm trying to say when you have them, which is natural and okay, what are some good strategies to handle them so that you can move forward successfully? That's our goal, whether it's anxiety or any other difficulty. And so just give yourself a break. Um, when you're trying to avoid and not think of something, that's exactly the opposite of what's gonna happen. If I ask you right now to not think of a puppy or a kitty, all your brains thought of a puppy or a kitty. That's our, our nature. So if I sit and say, don't think about my stressor, don't think about it, I'm going to think about it more. So be okay with that. It's okay to have those stressors. Give yourself some compassion, do some really simple techniques to connect and be calm. Remember laughter is great. Watch funny movies, tell funny jokes, play games where you laugh. Have some fun and levity and don't blame yourself because we're all human and we all have our moments where we struggle. And that's what makes us human and that, that's, that's natural. So if you're having that moment, it's okay. We all need help and there's lots of help available. All right. And I think we wanna make sure that you know of some resources as well. So here are some main resources that we put for you um, when thinking about mental health, both in the schools and in the community. For these hyperlinks about school, these are all on the main website under mental health that you could look back. And some of the um, 
parent questions that prompted tonight were, how do I get my kid back into the groove of going to school? And so there's a whole back to school care package with lots of great resources and ideas for you. And I think we're ready to open it up for questions. Absolutely. So there are a couple of ways to answer, to ask questions. You can uh, type a question into the question and answer section, or you can raise your hand and ask your question live. Um, I um, <clears throat> quite honestly have dealt with anxiety myself, and um, I'm so grateful for the information that both of you have provided this evening. So thank you. I seems to me that's a little bit more common than we we make it out to be, but I'm not the professional, so I just know from personal experience. Um, <clears throat> okay, it looks like we do have one question. Um, what is there a difference between anxiety and depression? That's a hard one to answer, I'm sure. Is it okay if I take it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that'd be great. And then I can add on if, if something comes to mind. Perfect. So when we think of anxiety, we usually think of a heightened arousal of the, of the nervous system, right? We think like everything goes on high alert. I need to respond. I need to respond. I need to respond. Um, sometimes it looks like the person is frozen up when when it's too much anxiety to the point of paralyzing them. However, usually what we think of before we get to that state, there is almost like an amping up um, until it gets to the point where it's no longer beneficial. And then there is um, a shutdown. With depression, we see the shutdown from the start. So really the hopelessness, the helplessness, um, the isolation, all of these things. With anxiety, we it, it has much more of an ebb and flow. Not to say that depression doesn't have an ebb and flow, but the ebb and flow is much, is much less pronounced. You come back to, you don't fully come back to neutral. You're always, um, not always, but for, for significant chunks of the day, for significant days, we have that um, low motivation, low mood, lack of desire and motivation to socialize, connect, do the things that make us happy. With anxiety, it kind of comes and goes actually rather abruptly. And there's different types of anxiety. Sometimes we can have anxiety about social situations. We can have anxiety about particular circumstances. Some people have more general anxiety. So kind of like waking up in the morning and already having that experience of doom and gloom um, or at other times during the day, but there is more of an ebb and flow. It's, it's much less firm. Um, I just want to mention one more form of um, anxiety, and these are panic attacks. These are those very heightened state of arousal when the person has a very rapid heartbeat. They're oftentimes confused. Their hands can shake. They're sweating profusely. In adults, sometimes we mistake that for um, a heart attack, but Panic attacks are completely um, psych uh, psychosomatic. That means we create them. They don't have physical um, concerns, but the, the, the fear, the angst, the, the psychological um, toll that they have is very high. And we really don't need to live like that. We don't need to live neither with anxiety nor with depression. Um, and usually, usually they... Um, you can tell them apart, but they can also co-occur. So someone who has depression might also have anxiety. And someone who's going through adjustment may have some depression and some anxiety. Mm -hmm. So just being aware of all that can go on. Um, really, as parents, as um, providers, your job is not really to diagnose your kid. Your job is to be attuned. And if the kid is suffering or they're acting differently than they have up to now, or they're not meeting their daily um, tasks of living, we sh shall we say, that's when you go to a professional and they can really tell you not only if the kid doesn't or doesn't have a diagnosis, but with or without diagnosis, what is the help that is going to be most useful? Yeah, and I will just add on, um, it's very important if you're not sure, like sometimes childhood problems on the surface look very similar. So as I showed you my list 
at school of what we might see. We might see inattention. We might see behavior difficulties. We might see lots of trips to the nurse for feeling sick mm -hmm. and there's not a biological reason to be sick and it's more anxiety based. Um, so when you're looking at kids and difficulties, sometimes anxiety, depression, um, attention, hyper deficit, activity disorder, those things can look very similarly. And it's important to know what exactly is going on with your child and how is it impacting them so that at school or in the community, we can really work on what's going to be most effective to help them. And so I think it's really good if you have concerns to reach out to your school counselor. Um, if it's more than that, work with your school counselor, work with your pediatrician to have resources on who in the community might be best for my child. Wow, that's all such great advice. Um, we do have a question, another question from one of our webinar um, attendees. And um, the question is, my daughter deals with anxiety. When she speaks to the counselor at school, the feedback I hear is that she's okay and doing well. When I ask my daughter directly, she says she's not well. Should I talk to the counselor or explore a therapist outside of school? I, I can take this one. I think it's a good idea to partner with your, your children's teachers and their counselor and really be able to have that open communication to say, I understand that my daughter might be doing well academically. Uh, maybe they don't get into trouble at school and they seem to have plenty of friends, but my, my daughter is you know, telling me she doesn't feel okay. And so I wanna make sure that I'm supporting her and she's getting what she needs here at school if, if there might be needs, but also there might be needs outside and then working with them to talk about um, who might be good providers in the area. We, we don't endorse any specific provider or agency from our school district, but we certainly have a list of people in the community in your areas to help you get started and find the right fit if you are needing some additional support. Thank you for that answer. Um, looks like we have one additional question before we wrap up this evening. And it is, um, it's asking if students are still feeling anxious from pandemic and um, situations they were in the past during the pandemic, or does that seem to be something that um, our students and our kids have moved beyond? I'm happy to start with that, and I'm sure you will have much more to add, Stephanie. Um, I will say that a lot of students do have lingering um, issues from COVID. Some of them really have been impacted, um, and I don't work at um, Douglas County. I work at another county, but I'm guessing that kids who've been exposed to pretty much the same conditions might have some of the same manifestations, and so I do see kids who are more hyper-concerned about um, viruses about transmission. A lot of them, when there's talk of COVID rising in the, in the news, get anxious about, oh no, we're gonna have to go back to remote schooling. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that term lightly, but some kids really are traumatized by COVID and it's going to take quite a bit of normalcy for them to realize that, that non-COVID is the new normal. Um, and so giving yourself and them grace is going to be important, um, as well as respecting what they need to feel safe. So if what they need to feel safe is really coming at the expense of other people, so if they're insisting other people wash their hands, put on masks, um, take six feet apart from them, that's a bit much. But we can encourage our own kids to wash their own hands, put their own masks. And if they feel safe for being six feet away, to really be gentle and kind and courteous and tell the other person, hey, it's not you. I have these fears. I need to do it for myself. And so taking that opportunity to really teach our kids how to be um, pro-social, how to get along with other people, but also how to honor what makes them feel safer. Yeah, absolutely. And I will add that um, that is part of our skill building for kids is how to empower them to be able to advocate for themselves and do strategies that help them to feel safe, whether that might be about something they're anxious about with friends or that might be they're anxious about getting sick. 
or any other anxieties they may have or worries. And so really being able to have that conversation of let's talk about what you're worried about and strategies that you can do and that you have control over and that will work so that they are safe and they have the perception of feeling safe because both of those are very important for them to be able to move maneuver in the world. Um, so exactly just what can they do to be empowered to advocate for themselves while, respect, while respectfully being in class and in other events with other people and being social with them. All great answers, thank you. Um, I don't appear to see any additional questions um, from anyone. Uh, we'll give it another moment in case we have any last minute questions coming in. And um, once again, wanted to thank our doctors who are on our panel today. We appreciate your expertise and your insight and our wonderful students. Um, our, oops, excuse me, and also our partnership with um, the Sky Ridge Medical Center, uh, who is our partner in making our parent university webinars possible. Um, our next um, parent university is October 26th. The topic is online safety. So if that is something you are interested in or someone you know is interested in, we will be promoting uh, that particular parent university on our social media and our website and um, all of our district communication. And um, just wanted to thank you all again for attending this evening. Um, everyone who was registered for this webinar will receive a recording link to this webinar in addition to the links that uh, were included on some of the earlier slides. So lots of resources there. And um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you again to everyone for your participation and hope you have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you.